My name is Elżbieta Matynia. I'm a professor of sociology and liberal studies at the New School for Social Research and the director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies here. Wherever you are, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to, to a talk by our friend and a longtime collaborator, Krzysztof Czyżewski from Sejny, a tiny town from Sejny and Krasnogruda. It's difficult to say they are close to each other. There is a village Krasnogruda and there is a tiny town Sejny, former shtetl on the eastern borders of Poland with Lithuania and Belarus, uh, more or less 300 kilometers um, from the border with Ukraine. This is the third guest lecture in this year's Transregional Center Fellowship Program, which uh, we've entitled Rethinking the Past, Reimagining uh, the Future. Um, a word about Transregional Dialogues, it is a non-residential project. Indeed, our, our fellows um, reside in Ukraine, Ireland, Brazil, and in New York. So it is non-residential yet highly interactive and collaborative initiative that brings together 22 fellows who are doctoral students in the social sciences, uh, very broadly defined social sciences. About half of them are in, uh, in a war shattered Ukraine right now. The other half are international doctoral students from various parts of the world, most of them studying here in New York at the New School. Uh, for us here uh, at the New School, since we began this program in uh, September, um, it has been an important learning moment. Um, but in fact, um, it is not a program about Ukraine, though the first week was very intensive uh, conversatorium on Ukraine that we conducted here. Um, and it is online and you can uh, see it. Um, it it's, it was a series of meetings with, uh, with uh, people mostly from Ukraine who are, who are talking about um, the present, the past, and the future of Ukraine. Um, two of the transregional dialogues working groups, we have four working groups, um, uh, one concerned with the politics of belonging and the other uh, working on the conditions of uh, post-coloniality, um, requested, uh, wanted to meet to listen and to talk uh, with Krzysztof Czyżewski. Krzysztof graciously accepted our invitation. And so today um, here is, he is with us here. Um, and uh, his talk is entitled, How to Break the Colonial Paradigm of Culture. I want to add that I have just learned that Krzysztof um, is not in Sejna, it's not in Krasnogruda, he's not in Poland. He is actually in Ukraine right now in a small place called Uschhorod in the Carpathian mountain, mountains, not far from Slovakia and not so far from Romania either. So it's in the southern part of, um, of uh, the beginning of the southern part of, East, of Central Europe. Um, the full bio of, of Krzyzewski, of Krzysztof Krzyzewski, of our today's speaker is online and the link is on, on chat. So let me just say that um, a few words about him. Uh, he, he, he's, he is known as practitioner of ideas. Um, he's a writer, he's a philosopher, he's animator of culture. Um, he is a theater director, he's editor. And um, in Ushhorod he is because there was a meeting, large meeting of, um, of, of people, I assume from the region, um, among them, some of those who, whom we hosted in September here, which is Professor Hrycak and Professor Jermolenko. Hello to you. Um, uh, Krzysztof Czeski is co-founder and president of the Borderland Foundation um, since 1990. Uh, he's the director of the Center Borderland of Arts, Cultures and Nations, um, located in Sejne and in Krasnogruda. He coordinates um, programs of intercultural dialogue in Europe, in Caucasus, in Central Asia, in Indonesia. I know that he was in Bhutan and in the United States. He, he, he was a visiting professor of, um, um, for many, many years uh, of Rutgers University. He was a visiting professor at the University of Bologna. He is a recipient of various awards, among them, uh, among them Dan David, Prize and Irena Sandlerova Prize and many, many others. 
Um, let me stop right here. I'd like to bring to you, introduce to you, and have, uh, and I, I'd like to ask Krzysztof to, to, to appear in front of us. Um, he's going to talk about uh, the title uh, of his talk is How to Break the Colonial Paradigm in Culture. Krzysztof Czyżewski. Thank you very much, Elżbieta, for this introduction and for inviting me uh, to your program. Uh, I'm really grateful for having opportunity first to talk about this subject. It will be the first time I will uh, deliver the lecture on how to break the colonial paradigm of culture. Although I did the notes to this lecture since many years, starting from Yugoslav War, uh, where I was engaged and learned a lot. Uh, and I see many uh, correlations between Yugoslav war and today's Ukraine. Also many, of course, differences, but the way how I think about the culture changed drastically uh, in the Balkans at the beginning of 90s. So, uh, but of course, the source for my thoughts today will be mostly from Ukraine, from Ukraine writers, poets, intellectuals, who are trying to answer um, in their language uh, how to emancipate uh, in today's world from the colonial culture, not only from colonial state, from uh, Kremlin, uh, Putin, Russia, but uh, also from the power of culture. But mm, my view would be when I will talk about issues between Ukraine and Russia, uh, this, please think not only about Russia and Ukraine, think about the West, think about your country in Ireland, in the United States, in Poland, because this is not, you know, this is a not unique uh, situation, a pretext, you know, to talk about the problems we have with colonial culture. Uh, mm, only from Russia side, yeah. It it gives me mostly the response to that uh, from Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians intellectuals is inspiring me, but I will uh, recall also some other some other names and experiences I have. Uh, so as Elzbieta said, I mean uh, in Ushorov the. Carpathia uh, region. Um, today, there was an opening of the forum Reopen the Carpathia, which is a, a forum uh, devoted to, um, uh, to think how the region, like multicultural region, uh, like the Carpathia, the region of Ukraine, can contribute to the victory of Ukraine, to the rebuilding of the country, but also what is the in such region and the Europe, the European Union and some other partnerships. So this is all you know, what this discussion today goes around. And uh, we had today the opening speech by Alexandra uh, Matvijchuk, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, from Kiev. I'm recalling her speech because he, what was interesting in, in it was that she was recalling uh, her meeting with President Macron in France recently, and that uh, one of the topics of the uh, was the cultural front line, why French um, uh, society are so so involved uh, and so. Uh, uh, engage in Russian culture. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's uh, France is a former colonial empire. You know, there is no issue about the military or economic powers of the empire, but still the issue of colonial culture is alive in France. Yes. Anymore 
empire uh, as a state, but still you have a strong influence of a colonial empire culture and, and the ties between Russia and France uh, are very often based on, uh, on this relationship. So um, she was talking, like think about how we Ukrainians can use or can work with culture to make a difference in uh, yeah, also in France, uh, uh, France uh, in France, yes, among the people. So this will be a little bit I will touch upon in my lecture, as I will touch upon the role of region of a small uh, locality, uh, uh, in, because this is you know I'm among the people who respect the U. Aging local issues uh, and uh, local culture uh, uh, and so on, uh, which is one of the answers I also will bring to our discussion for how to break the colonial paradigm of culture. Uh, first, uh, I want to say that culture, of course, determines what is ours. And this is one of the crucial ground, uh, grounds I want to discuss with you because uh, 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 as ours in different ways, it could be determined through cultural colonialism. So subordination of small to the big the province to the center, the minority to the majority, the diverse to homogeneous. So uh, although it could be a positive road, like through assimilation, attraction to the center, escape from parochialism, identification of the local with the particular rather than the universal, so you can find the positive somehow, not very, but somehow positive way to understand this cultural colonialism. But uh, uh, of course, there, there could be a negative, much more negative uh, way through erasing, you know, annihilating the smaller uh, cultures and, 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 and so on. Or so the culture determines what is ours also through the culture of a small centers of the world, which is my opposite answer to, uh, to the colonial culture, which is hospitable. And around that, I developed this concept of xenopolis also I want to say that what I'm going to talk uh, about today is not fr directly from my book um, towards Xenopolis, which was recently published in, uh, in English, but it's rather a step forward. You know, the, 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 those of you who know this book will uh, easily discover that I'm developing some concept uh, from that book in a new way. So uh, this culture of small centers of the world is interdependent, is based on solidarity and responsibility for the common. In it, what it ours grows not from expansion and subjugation, but from giving place to the other through withdrawal, restraint, and empathy. So I will struggle to, to prove that the, the home becomes mine, the more it gives place to the other. And curse for the totality of the environment, the more hospitable and ecological it is, uh, the, uh, the more a real home it is, a real mind. It is. Universality comes from rootedness. Openness comes from transcending the self. Freedom comes from solidarity with others. 
that's the directions uh, in general I want to uh, design around the debate of how we can break the colonial paradigm of culture down. So, and now I will present you some uh, short thoughts, like gnomic paragraphs I have, just to open up the discussion around them. I will add a few words around that, or maybe we can come back to them in the discussion. But first, what I think, or, uh, I want to put to the, ta to the table of our discussion is, in contrary, somehow uh, to the direction I want to develop my reflection be because my reflection will be rather critical to culture uh, in general, um, uh, self-critical from the inside of culture. But the first thing comes to my mind is that Mark culture is colonial. So usually you will say, Christoph, Christoph, please yeah. repeat. You are we are you are breaking. Repeat okay. the beginning of the sentence. So the big you said is colonial. Marginalizing yeah. culture is colonial. So usually you would say that colonial uh, wants to have culture as its weapon. Yes, but colonial culture can only be overcome through culture. Colonial culture can only be defeated through culture. Disregarding culture, placing it, claiming that it can wait because there are more important things. All this adds up to the post-colonial syndrome, which I know very well in, from my Polish experience. Although, yes, that's how we treat the culture in general. It's at, at the end. We have, we have trans, we have a major heart, you know, most serious, important things to change, to develop it, and so on. And culture can wait, yeah, in, in that the empire may lose military or economically, but it can still enslave culture for a long time, uh, time. It will condone or even finance the construction of roads and, and for the exploitation of natural resources, of course, but it will not promote emancipation through education and creativity. So when we care about the culture, in general, we, we disagree with margin, marginalization of culture. We somehow open this education and creativity. The next point, uh, point is the colonial paradigm of culture could be break by peremoha. This special Ukrainian word, I really propose that we all in United States, in Poland, in Brazil, we should learn this word, peremo, which you can translate as a victory in English, yes, but it is not the same, although it is about, you know, gaining victory, but peremoha is something like overcoming, you know, like a victory based on a long process of struggles. And I think, that peremocha is something what Ukrainians invented today in our world. In the world which was, which was obsessed with peace, with peace working, you know, with peace management, with peace activities and so on. It was all incredibly valuable after Second World War. But suddenly we are facing the situation that we have a nation, a society, and just people struggling for victory, for peremoha. And it has a strong, amazingly strong effect on culture in my mind. 
empire will accept without too much concern that its opponents are on the good side. As we, for so many years, in terms of moral values, of human rights, but never that they will turn out to be winners. The absolute uniqueness and opp opportunity for the world of the war in Ukraine lies in that fact that thanks to the Ukrainians at stake of this war is not to be on good side, but to be victorious. And to be on good side in that means all my life, uh, the meaning of it was that uh, it ends in defeat combined with hopes that it will be better, but in a different world. So there is no chance for us to be victorious um, in today's, in our life, in our world. It, it could happen somewhere else and in a different time. So. And now I want to bring a quotation from a, a Ukrainian poet, Iya Kiva. Uh, I found it uh, in Facebook, where she was sharing his reflect, uh, her reflection. Just listen for a moment. Reading various materials Iya Kiva is writing, I realized that war texts a Russian would say anti-war texts. Even if at the same time, the latter is talking about the text of the Ukrainian author. This is some subtle psychological denial of reality, according to Freud. Do you hear me? Because I have some- We hear you, yes. we okay. hear you, but you are breaking I'm, sometimes, but I, if it okay. will be major, I will tell you. Okay, so I'm continu uh, continuing to quote Ia Kieva, uh, Kiva, and uh, not even from an evalu uh, evaluative point of view, but simply as a certain experimental worldview difference in the answer to the questions, who am I and what I'm doing here? When they came to kill you, you don't have to prove that you are against the war. And the text, because this is your war, also not really yours, but imposed on you by the anti-war world. It is about this war imposed like any other violence that the Ukrainian will always say, my war and the Russian war. That being said, war always shows us who we are. Pose you in place of the word Russian, uh, we can insert others, Germans, Americans, Westerners. That's how we say, it is not our war or it is anti-war. This is about Peremoha also to take it as our, as part of our struggle. And that's why Peremoha comes to, uh, to uh, as something very real uh, in, in, in that. The next point. Colonial culture is marginalizing you as a subject of history. Rather obvious thing I think, uh, but what I want to underline here is that you may be on the right side, I coming to that point. You could be pacifist, you could be anti-war activist, you could be critical on dictatorship. This is not a main problem for the regime but you cannot be victorious, a warrior, a Peremoha maker. Okay, the next one, 
is colonial culture is written, uh, written in the grammar of the claimer, a grammar that shatters responsibility. My next point, and I, for a moment, I want to go to the uh, reflection of, uh, I want to see it from inside of Russia, Russian culture. And I uh, will bring here um, uh, the reflection of Mikhail Epstein, Epstein, the Russian American scholar, uh, who is uh, trying to answer the question why we Russians are in Ukraine. And his answer to that question is very symptomatic uh, because he, it goes with the weather and with the language. So uh, what he is writing is that the greedy interest in weather reports, with, as it was in Soviet Union and as it is uh, now, but in the Soviet time, it was explained, first of all, by the fact that only this news could be trusted. In addition, it is easy to blame the troubles of personal and social life on the weather. Yes, yes, it strengthened us in the sweet sense of its pardonable irresponsibility, writes Epstein. Indeed, in a country subject, Subject to the whims of leaders, tyrants, senseless laws, it is a real pleasure to experience the harmful but innocent effects, snow, rain, radiation, fumes. And second uh, point he's making, uh, let's look at it from a linguistic point of view. The Russian language has a grammatical property by which it su suppresses all European ones. The ability to form impersonal constructions. The Russian language prefers to function as if it were performed by itself, by some impersonal force in the absence of subject. So, eta nie my przyszli. Eta nas zaniesło. It was not us who came here. Something carried us here. Such fatalism embodied in the mechanism of Russian grammar did not stagger, but on the contrary, became stronger in the linguistic evolution of the 20th century. Also, it would seem it came into conflict with the official ideology of Soviet men in the past, you know, the master of his own destiny, Hazayin Sfai Impersonality grows and develops itself as a category not only of grammar, but also of the people's worldview, or if you like, of the social subconsciousness. And this is what interests me, you know, that why, why, why we are in Ukraine, why we Russians, that something made it for us. Yes, something external to us. And there is a quotation of, of another writer, Yuri Nagibin, um, from his diary at the end of his life, 1994, 1994 uh, which goes like that. People often ask themselves, each other, what will happen? Foreigners ask us the same question with Gaibel Horror. What will happen to Russia? By nothing, absolutely nothing, but nothing. There will uh, be the same uh, uncertainty, swell, swamp, outbreaks of bad passions. This is at best fascism at worst. Is it really possible? The greatest fault of the Russian people is that they are always innocent in their own eyes. We don't regret anything. Maybe it's time to stop fooling around that the Russian people were and remain the plaything of forces lying outside of them. A consent, um, a convenient, cunning, vile lie. Everything in Russia was done by Russian hands with Russian consent. They themselves sold bread. They themselves leathered the robes. Neither Lenin nor Stalin, now we can add Putin, would be our fate if we didn't want it. And the answer of 
uh, Mikhail Epstein is, that's why we are in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So that's what colonial culture is making with uh, cultural people from inside. Yeah? That it comes from abroad, you know, from, uh, from another reality. It, it means what we are doing, you know, the action is we are not responsible somehow for that. So this is this colonial culture is written in the grammar of the claimer, a grammar that shatters a responsibility. And another point uh, which will follow is empire authenticates itself through eternity. It has existed eternally and will continue to exist that way. Even if it enslaves, is a source of suffering and injustice, it has always been that way and will continue to be that way. Therefore, it needs a culture of eternity, ever renewing patterns of dominion and subjugation. In this way, the culture created is not a matter of choice, of individual desires or the expression of an individual destiny. It is from the bestowal of eternity, of an impersonal power that has dominion in this world. If we are allow other scenarios of a more just and free world, yes, they grow out of men's authentic longing, but they are utopian. To be realized only in another world, such a victory is possible only in heaven. And if it is possible only in heaven, so we are somehow irresponsible to make this struggle, to, to have this victory down in our reality, in our world. It's somehow I see in, in this point a relation to what Timothy Snyder writes about in his book, The Road uh, to Unfreedom. If you remember, he, he structured his book between two, uh, uh, two uh, poles. Yes, from one side, it was a kind of like dichotomy between the politics of inevitability, yes, inevitability. Uh, if uh, uh, if I pronounce it well, yes. Uh, uh, Something which is inevitable. Yes, no word, you know. Yes, yeah, and the politics of eternity. Yeah, and and I I think it would be interesting to add to his narrative the dimension of culture because I relevant to uh, to build this politics of eternity. Uh, it comes, uh, it has his uh, support, its support very much from that ground. The next point, to be sure, the empire wants to provide the culture with the comfort of an autonomous principality. This is, of course, the artists are often seduced by them, sooner or later finding out that visas to this principality are not given free of charge. Doesn't this attitude, I'm asking, sometimes have something to do with, that, uh, with how we understand culture in the West? As an autonomous kingdom that should take care of its freedom, understood as cutting itself off from dependencies with the world and everyday life, and going further, to free culture from responsibility for what happens in the world, going further on to say that Russian culture is not responsible for the Kremlin's policies and has nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. He listened for a moment, Sergei Zhadan. I'm quoting, as probably you know, he's writing his war diaries. Uh, on the Facebook very soon in our publishing house, we'll uh, publish a whole war diary of Sergei Jadam. But his is just a short quotation on that subject when he writes, to what extent can culture be more colonial than language? 
the language, let's say, of an ordinary Kharkiv, a Russian speaking, of course, policeman, pulling Russian speaking old ladies who voted for a pro-Russian pro party out from under the rubble and who are now being bombarded by the president of a country that is here to, in quotes, great Russian culture. In the context of history, this policeman is far more powerful and compelling than the entire Tsarist tradition with its golden and silver ages. He saves people and the imperial culture kills them. Yes, yes, just the culture. End of quotation of Sergei Zhadan. A culture comfort zones fortresses, a perverse form through the multiplication and expansion of comfort zones into other territories. We should speak more about what these comfort zones are, but this quotation of uh, Iakiva and some others I al already recalled are in connection to, to that. But this, what I want to stress now here is how colonial culture operates. It, it builds, establishes its fortresses in foreign territories. The next point is colonial culture separates beauty from goodness and truth. It gladly offers this comfort to the people of culture, knowing full well that in this way it will maintain colonial power. The arrangement the Putin regime maintains with the world of culture is not that there are supporters and opponents of the regime, but that the culture is a separate world, neutral to war, and not meddling in politics or in the general affairs of this world. It is to deal with eternity. Isn't there a rationale behind this? What a comfortable explanation for the Nobel Committee's decision to award Peter Handke the Nobel Prize. Yes, regime. yes, he denied Serb responsibility for Srebrenica genocide. About how he did it is a, another, another conversation if uh, I would like to once to, uh, to have, because it's not you know, in, in the, the, he is too smart, you know, to do it, saying not Serbs are not responsible, but he don't know, yeah. How you should know, maybe, maybe not, maybe yes or maybe not, yeah. Just to, you know, to, to erase this border between what is good and evil, yeah. Just question it, yes, and it works. If there is no real good or, real evil, e e there's no responsibility somehow. So yes, he was um, the denier of this genocide, but after all, his literature, perfectly written, deals with eternal matters. And another example, isn't this a perfectly comfortable explanation for the decision of the Kandinsky Prize, Jiri? including representatives of the Guggenheim Foundation or Deutsche Bank to ennoble Alexei Belayev's work to the highest artistic rank, offering him Kandinsky Prize. His work, and now I'm quoting a letter of a Russian protest artists who protested, uh, protested against this decision and they were writing his work glorifies violence, imperial domination, blood, soil, and war. It does this in a consciously triumphal neo-Stalinist aesthetic, mixing crimson with gold leaf to confirm its redundant imperialist, imperialist message. Some local bourgeois are taken with this aesthetic. Fascism thus enters the salon. It was 2008 when he received the Kandinsky Prize. He is 
you know, he is part of this Dugin group and schools. And, uh, and, uh, and now we know that it's hard to ignore him today, but at that time, you know, it was, this decision was made in the name of a free world, you know, uh, no censorship. Yes, we, we, we live in a, uh, a liberal free world, so we does, uh, do not uh, uh, do our concerns about politics, about his political statement, about his relationships with Dugin and so on, because we are free of that, because the culture is an autonomous kingdom. That's, you know, Timothy Snyder is writing that this shift to fascism started in Russia in 2012. It happened 2008. So it proves in my mind that culture was against an avant-garde, being at, at the front line, at first line, with, uh, with entering with fascism to the mainstream, to the salons, and so on. Another point, a culture becomes colonial when it focuses on itself and on its own, even when it concerns the undeserved suffering of its own, even when it acquires an all human humanistic dimension, even when it becomes critical of its own power, even when it stigmatizes the darknesses of the people, the corruption of its official, moral decay of its clergy, clergy, all these does not yet mean that it has issues, issued a battle against its own cultural imperialism. Only when it is able to step into the shoes of the societies it colonizes to look at the world from the perspective of its enslaved neighbor, to be in solidarity with the emancipatory struggles of other peoples, cultures, languages, only then does it become an anti-imperial culture. The next point close to that is empire is focusing you in yourself, in your survival, makes your memory self-obsessive. Your responsibility is not the world, the others. Because you are subdued to the imperial culture, you have this excuse to be self-centered. Your emancipation means to break the self-centeredness down. One comment to that is a word about Jerzy Giedrich and the magazine under the title Cultura Culture published in Paris after Second World War. Yes, I'm calling, uh, recalling it because this is the tradition in Poland who changed this paradigm in our culture that he, what he, they did through the culture magazine was that we Poles, I, I'm a, a real proof uh, of that, that we were free from self-obsessiveness on our own suffering, on our own, so on, and started to think about uh, uh, the perspectives of our neighbors, yeah, of li mostly Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians. Uh, and it could be that it could be uh, different and that rather than um, focusing on our own suffering, we should engage in helping our neighbors to gain independence, sovereignty. So that's what culture did, in fact, that you, you can change it uh, only in, uh, thanks to culture. Colonial is a generalization, another point. A culture that turns the concrete into the abstract, the individual into the mass. And that's, that uh, is why now I will quote another Ukraine. 
had the right to ask in desperation in Pysiu? the days of yes. Przepraszam, nie słyszeliśmy kogo cytujesz. Yuri Andruhovich. Okay. Yeah, and so he mm, uh, uh, had the risk to ask in desperation in the days of the Bucha crime uh, revelation. I'm quoting Andruhovich now. Mr. Dostoevsky, did you fucking write something about the tears of a child? Did it help your Russians somehow? As we remember, uh, so this end of the quote, yes. So uh, what what Andruhovich, what Yuri is doing here is uh, uh, making uh, making this reference to Ivan Karamazov from the Dostoevsky novel. As you remember, Kara Ivan uh, was uh, very concerned about the innocent suffering of a child, and in the name of a child's tear. He returns a ticket to the paradise to God, renounces belief in goodness in the world established by such a God, and chooses nihilism. Since the world is arranged in such a way, the line between good and evil is, evil is irrelevant. This tear, as well as the child itself, are abstract for Ivan Dostoevsky. Precisely, they do nothing to improve its fate, to create a network of orphanages or a charity on a large scale or a pedagogy of the scale of Janusz Korczak. Nothing like that. You, you disagree with how the world is constructed, that the child, innocent child is crying. So we gi you give back but uh, the ticket to the paradise, but become at the same time nihilist. Yeah, that's how I understand it is an abstract thing. Yeah, you don't think about other child, ch uh, children, you know, to help them, to make uh, uh, the suffering uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, to struggle with that and so on. Any practical action in the world. It is abstract, abstract, so I'm becoming a nihilist, yes? And I do not care at all in answer uh, for that. So that's how you generalize, because in concrete, you do everything for your child, yes? For every child in your country, as Ukrainians today do in their country. Yeah, they do not give back the ticket to the God. Yeah, being oblivious of the fate of, of the children and so on. That's, I think, this difference. The colonial culture is centralized, establishes itself on the great center and needs the province. It feeds on the province because it knows that only a revolt of the province can overthrow it and sustains the provinciality. This applies to the maintenance of power, which is threatened by worldliness, emancipation, overcoming provinciality, but also, for example, tourism or attractive to them is exoticism tailored to the needs of the great center. Thus, valuing this center with superiority over the backward, the antidote, the antidote to this is decentralization, the creation of small centers of the world. In this also has its source a positive understanding of the province, a place that is not burdened by the enslavement of large numbers, is not governed by the logic of monopolization, subjugation of other centers, but takes its of other small centers from the coexistence and interdependence. The next point, colonial culture is about of what is local and regional, which is in connection to the previous one. 
And now I want to, to quote uh, another. Christoph, could you please repeat the first sentence? Colonial culture is? It's about disrespect of what is local and regional. And now I want to quote uh, another Ukrainian writer, Andriy Lyubka, who lives, who is one of the organizers of this forum. And uh, what he's talking about is, it is important to have our own local histor uh, historical memory because patriotism begins precisely with a small homeland. We have to op uh, the opportunity now to fill the streets with a local context, to remember those who built this city, rise whole generations here, because it was these people who made Ushhorov Ushhorov. This is his response to this heritage of Soviet times when in, in small regions like Zakarpatia, they have full Soviet monuments, you know, Soviet names uh, as street names and so on, but a little or at all sometimes, nothing from local history, from uh, uh, local ground. This is a revol small revolution, uh, revolution with, which is happening now in Ushorot and other Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, cities and, and regions. Sometimes when you see from a far Western perspective, you may con be concerned that maybe, oh, it is a kind of a nationalist, you know, they don't want to have Pushkin Street in Ushorot. Well, that tragedy, what they want um, uh, from Pushkin, he, he was a poet, he was a genius, you know, why not to have a monument of Pushkin uh, in Ushhor, yeah? And, and when you try to overthrow it, it is like, it's read like a nationalist action. But I, I have another point to, uh, to that, yes? I think that people have right to build their own uh, map of culture, uh, out of their own heritage, uh, based on uh, on the local memories, and it will open them up to the world. If you will constrain these possibilities, then you will have, as an answer, nationalism. In fact, uh, and I'm continue uh, continuing to quote Andriy Lubka as a post because it's also important for Ukrainians today, as a post-Soviet country that is trying to break out of the third world and move into the normal world, we are interested in what is illuminated by big spotlights. We are more fascinated by the French, British and Germans. Also, it would be more useful and productive for us to think about Slovaks, Czechs and Poles. By the way, we know more about the latter. They actively promoted the culture here in Poles. So, what, what Andriy Lubka is engaged, we would say years ago, that he is engaged in Central European culture development, that we have here uh, between Russia and Germany, we have a, a land of culture based on small centers, multicultural heritage, but uh, emancipated as small kingdoms, regions, uh, and so on. And what Soviet time did and what market free, uh, you know, neoliberal market did it is that we abandoned all, uh, abandoned all that and the impact of colonial culture, even today on us would be that we'll be more focused on what is far away in Paris or London than with our neighbors, with our environment around again. I'm not talking about exclusiveness and, you know, closing yourself in Central Europe, you know, being focused only on uh, local relationship uh, and so on. What I am trying to say is it is much easier to be in touch in correspondence with London and New York, much difficult with your neighbors. That's, you need another kind of culture uh, another art of bridging, much more sophisticated, much more challenging, if you are doing it with your neighbors. Yeah, it's easy to escape from that context to the general world. Yeah, but but the way to be open, to be cosmopolitan somehow, 
uh, in that, uh, that way is about respecting your neighbors, about respecting your place, and this will open you up to the others, to the, the, to the great world as well. I'm coming to the end. So the last points I have are culture is colonial when it becomes an elitist. With an utter disregard for people and their lives. So it's not about only neighbors, but also in general on people. And uh, now I want to quote the Ukrainian writer Artem Chapai. Uh, he was born not far from here in Kolomea, in the Hutsulian region. His first book was on travel across America. Uh, his famous nonfiction book is about the Donbass. But what is very interesting, uh, what he wrote in Facebook about his position toward the world in Ukraine was that he do not want anymore to be a writer about this war. He wants to be a soldier. And uh, the made by him, thanks to empathy, I guess, to, to the people, to the simple people around. Just listen for a moment. When we, my child and my wife, we uh, were still on the road to escape from the dangerous zone in the first days of the war, it suddenly occurred to me that, as usual, the simple people, in quotes, would pay with their lives first and foremost. And people like me, in quote, would be able to shield and just say or write something about it. This thought made a strong impression on me. I would be ashamed of myself if I did so. I long to become the people, say so. Only as it turned out, it's not easy. In the first weeks, I came to shun the position of press secretary arranged for me, then another secretary for paperwork. I kept saying that a rifleman is a rifleman. I didn't go to the army to do the same thing I do in ordinary life. I wanted to be an ordinary soldier without an intelligent, intelligent, but we from intelligentsia, a person of culture, position. I didn't want. Well, I became soldier. I'm quoting that. Not, not, of course, please understand me. I don't think that everybody should follow the way of uh, Andrew, uh, Artem Chapai. Yes, it is, it is his decision. Uh, uh, but what is, what is interesting me is what influenced his decision? Just staying with people, just being with them, not allowing himself to be separated because he is a cultural person. Yeah, I think that's the seed of deconstructing colonial culture as well. And the last point, is colonial culture has a good deal with both cosmopolitanism and nationalism. It goes well with both cosmopolitanism and nationalism. Uh, cosmopolitanism looks down on the local, on being rooted in a small homeland, on cultivating the small language, nationality, problem, distinctiveness. Nationalism looks down on world life fears, meeting other, fortifies in its own identity and uniqueness. The perversion of colonial culture is that it laces the great center with nationalism, often in a radical form, chauvinism, while the provinces with a degenerate form of cosmo uh, cosmopolitanism through uprooting mass products of world pop culture, self-negation, and the disappearance of a sense of self-dignity. The antidote to this, in my mind, is a third way, which we struggle to find in contemporary world, I think, between 
cosmopolitanism and nationalism, which I call Xenopolis, combining rootedness in community polis with openness to the otherness, xenos, to human and ecological coexistence. The way to world citizenship leads a small center of the world. That's my short answer to that, but you will find this answer in many examples I gave during my lecture, how to oppose colonial culture. So thank you for your attention. I hope we'll have discussion uh, now mm, and I have I will have the opportunity to to develop some of these points maybe uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Krzysztof. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to invite um, to join us uh, four of our fellows who will actually ask you questions. And they might be hard questions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, here they are. Katerina uh, Pesotska is from Kiev, where she is, is uh, uh, studying law at National University of Kiev Mohila Academy. Katerina. The second one, the second fellow is Uliana Kirchiv. And today, today uh, we have three uh, Ukrainian fellows actually asking questions, which mm -hmm. I think um, it's actually, it's quite uh, interesting and proper to uh, to uh, kind of relate it, though we didn't really know what you are going to talk about, to what you said. So Katarina Pesotska, Uliana Kirchiv from the Department of History of the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Hi. And then um, Andriy Komiak, uh, mm -hmm. Andriy Komiak, who is uh, uh, the Department of Sociology uh, in Kiev, uh, a National Technical University or Kiev Polytechnic uh, um, Institute, uh, which is named after uh, Ihor Sikorsky. And finally, Will Stringer, mm -hmm. who studies anthropology at the, at the Maynooth University in Ireland but who himself is Scottish. Mm -hmm. uh, so here are our people, and I'm just giving you guys the floor or the screen. And maybe we'll just start just as I just I started with Katerina. And I'm pleased that you are there and that you have electricity and that you could join mm -hmm. us. Yeah, Katerina. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I had to stay in the office to actually join the session because Will is my partner from our discussion group, so he knows how actually my candles at home look like when I do not have any electricity. Mm -hmm. So, Krzysztof, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very thought provoking for me. Yeah, for me, because as uh, it was mentioned, I'm a law student. So some of the parts still like are not falling in, in my academic side. Uh, and uh, as my PhD topic is connected with political parties, so I wanted also to ask you, how do you think this colonial, colonial paradigm, paradigm of culture can be broken uh, by political parties and what their role should be? And I guess it would be interesting to hear uh, your answer also from the perspective of Ukrainian society. And what do you think about the uh, society in Russian? Federation and their political parties, whether there is any hope mm -hmm. for this process to be started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I would say um, that politicians has a lot to do with my topic and my concern, because many things are in their hands uh, as a decision makers, as people who construct the priorities you know of uh, political party programs of the government program of the state program and uh, my worry is since many years that we do not see culture as an important player in the the most important issues we are responsible for and uh, my concern is that partly the guilt is on our cultural people's side. Because we created culture 
in today's world, mostly as an event-oriented culture. Yeah, the, the, our culture is obsessed with festivals, with short-term events. That's how it goes on. So politicians could, you know, just fully ask, okay, it works, you know, what do you want more? You know, we, it could be commercial, you know, we can give some support to that, no problem. Where, where, where do you see the problem? Yes. So uh, to change this policy, you know, this way of understanding, a lot is about what we do propose from the field of culture. That, and what, what I was trying to, to uh, say about today, about these small centers of the world, you know, concept, uh, it, it, it needs a revolutionary attitude, to, uh, attitude to, for the Minister of Culture, for example. Yes, because these things are really invisible for uh, for the clerks responsible in the government in the political parties about about the culture they do not understand much why the small center is so important you know what uh, in the revitalization of ukraine after the war and this is a big issue a big hope uh, for me concerning ukraine you know of course we are heading maybe too far to the future, we have now different problems, but maybe you sh we should already think about, uh, about that, what the role of culture will be in rebuilding Ukraine and, and how we will convince our international partners to support our ambitious uh, cultural program as well as others with democratization, you know, with road building, rebuilding and, and factories and so on. My experience, for example, from the Yugoslav war time in the Balkans is very bad. Yeah, there was, after the war, there was an, an, an agreement of a huge international organizations to help, you know, former Yugoslav countries to be rebuilt. There was a kind of a, round table of different partners, organizations, and imagine there was no room around this table for education. Because when I'm saying culture, I also not using this in a narrow terms of art, but it is education and culture together, yes? So there was no room for that, yeah? So, uh, and now I think they pay the price in the Balkans, you know, that, that uh, it was not a serious investment uh, in, uh, in that field. So uh, this is a question, yes, how, uh, how we will uh, structure um, our cooperation, our work together uh, to to avoid such um, repeatedness, you know, in the Ukrainian context, yeah, or, uh, of course. So I would be all the time open to any kind of discussions with lawyers, with politicians, you know, with political parties, because we should have a consensus, uh, which means today a revolutionary consensus on the role of culture in that process. Mm -hmm. I wonder, Christoph, because you are from a small town, you are you you are working mm -hmm. and active very much in small town. I'm not trying to connect that to the question, mm -hmm. Katerina's question, and whether whether you can comment mm -hmm. and maybe help her out this way um, about um, about reflecting for very briefly about the role of local self government and mm -hmm. the role of um, of locally based parties um, uh, bridging right with uh, people on the right. ground uh, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily not necessarily as closely um reporting to the center mm -hmm. it's a I different see. kind of structures of course structure of course yeah and i'm no, sorry I should not have a question but i but 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 katarina's mm -hmm. katarina kind of provoked me um mm -hmm. particularly after your lecture after your after what you were saying mm -hmm. the importance of um you know the political structures could be also translated into the local structures and they often are so there is a role of uh, of, uh, of of that environment which is right there which mm -hmm. which also could be supported or infused with the 
with the power of mm-hmm. NGOs and so on. So it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's absolutely uh, important what you are saying, local politics, local governments. My experience w- uh, is that they would understand much better the importance of culture uh, in the town, region, province development, but they are, again, subdued to the center with finance in their own country, but in uh, in Brazil, yes, in the West, there is a little understanding of uh, uh, investment which we uh, we need to provide for such uh, such development. So again, the the fight is more in the center, you know, in um, to convince that we. When you take the context of European Union, for example, yes, it is it is easy to say that we spent a lot of money, a lot of support for culture. Talk with them; they will prove, you know, with different numbers and huge amounts of money they provide for culture. Yes, but the way they do it, yeah, it's it's in question for me because it's very little room for this organic cultivating in local societies, in polis, in small democratic um, entities, and the culture field that is mostly going. I was working for years as an advisor for European Cultural Foundation in Amsterdam, and we did a research, you know, how we spend money for culture, for example, and imagine more than 80% is spent on festivals. So if it is so, you can't tell seriously about investment in culture, in my understanding of that, of the cultivation in daily life, you know, that you for long term continue this organic, positivistic uh, uh, work to deconstruct the colonialism, uh, which goes also with culture uh, and so on. So. Nobody wants to invest in long term, you know, in something what is invisible or uh, what is reachable in 10 or 20 or 30 years and so on. And this is how we enslave somehow by this market event oriented understanding of the reality. So that's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uliana Kierchev. Uliana is historian from Lviv. From the from the Catholic University, Ukrainian Welcome. Catholic University in Lviv. <laughs> Cześć, Juliana. Cześć. Cześć. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for a very interesting and inspiring lecture. It gave me a lot of food for thought, and I wanted also to congratulate you on the on Independence Day <laughs> and to thank you and thank you. all of our. Mm-hmm. Uh, Polish colleagues for everything you are doing for us. Um, thank you. And thank now you. I have a lot of comments and really a lot of questions, but I will try to be as concise as possible. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, first Go of on. all, um, I have a question because um, the if we talk about the colonial paradigm of culture, of course, it is important thing uh, also um, about from which point of view we talk about it, right? So we talk uh, about it from the point of view of the colonizer, or we talk of, uh, about uh, it uh, from the point of view of the colonized culture, and also um, are we talking about the state policy or about the individuals? Because mm-hmm. um, what you were talking about, it was more about the individuals and um, the problem with this is in my, in my opinion, of course, <laughs> uh, is that individuals, uh, they will always remain uh, like very local thing, right? Um, without uh, uh, mm-hmm. state support. Uh, that is a first comment or question, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and also, um, 
my question is, uh, when we talk about the breaking of uh, colonial paradigm of uh, the culture, um, are we really talking uh, about the breaking or we are talking about the um, breaking of the perception of uh, colonial parting, or we are talking about the overcoming our past or our colonial parting. Because we in Ukraine, um, I believe that we are quite, um, we quite good. Uh, we have a quite quite good understanding that we are the part of the colonial culture, that that uh, Russian colonial uh, culture was uh, impressing us um, very, very long time, right? And what do we have to do now? So do we have to understand it, um, research it, uh, discuss it, uh, overcome it and go further? Uh, mm -hmm. or what, right? That's a mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, so my, um, um, one of the biggest question of mine uh, about the future of Ukrainian culture, so I am afraid of the kitsch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Have uh, our own word you can uh, it's called Shagavashina. Um, Uliana, you are breaking your question. Uliana, um, you repeat your last sentence. Colonial, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I was. Um, the um, process that Ukrainian culture is very much connected to the kitsch because of that um, colonial uh, influence, right? And um, mm -hmm. I, I personally uh, don't believe that the victory or the peremoha uh, will be very, um, you know, very um, bright or happy aspiration, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, I think that we all uh, will think um, on that day about our of all, uh, all of our um, dead friends or relatives and so on, and we will finally let us cry as much as we want. So mm -hmm. it will be not a very happy day. Mm -hmm. uh, but the culture which will be created, created after the victory uh, mm -hmm. is a much um, a point of my concern <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, we don't know. Uh, will it be the mass culture which will be, as I suppose, very uh, kitsch? Or will, will it be a local culture will, which will be a much deeper thing, right? Mm -hmm. So and, um, my last comment is about Russian culture. Um, uh, a few months ago, I was writing an article about um, why is it important to console Russian culture <laughs> in the mm -hmm. West? Uh, and uh, I was I was doing uh, some research uh, about Russian culture, and I was a little bit surprised because um, it seems that um, there are different narratives uh, about Russian culture, and one narrative, uh, which is um, um, mostly uh, for the West. Uh, is so um, modernistic or avant-gardistic, you know, and the mm -hmm. uh, narrative, which is um, for Russia itself, uh, it is a renaissance of the realism. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, want to um, rebirth uh, a realism uh, inside of the Russia. Uh, and um, the, the difference 
between those two narratives is huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and that's that, that, that's it because we have two more people to, to mm -hmm. jump in. Shishtaf. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Uliana. Thank you. Thank you, Uliana. And thank you also for everything what you are doing for us, you know, in the day of Polish independence. <laughs> but we feel that you are doing a, a lot of amazing work for us, Poles, as well. So uh, you you raise many questions, and um, I will try to answer from from the end from what you what uh, about your concern about culture you, uh, and and Peremocha. Uh, I agree, Uliana, that it will be not easy. Just fantastic holiday, you know that we that it is done. Yeah, of suffering together with that maybe there will be not a clear clear momentum you know saying this is it yeah that it will be kind of a process maybe unreachable in full like peremocha but what i uh, trying to stress is that the the most important thing you already did as ukrainians that you put at stake victory as a goal, yeah. All my life, I was, you know, I spent experiencing uh, the corrupted peace making, you know, in different corners of the world. Corrupted in in terms of unjustful, not solving anything, you know, just giving time for the aggressor to be stronger and making you know, helping him to attack in a few years or so on and so on. Yeah. So, and it was always in the interest of the West you not know, to keep, you know, peacefulness. Yeah, we have this connection between peace and peacefulness, which was uh, uh, somehow overlapped in, in the West. Yes, we, we, liked, uh, we like to have peacefulness. And that's how we understood the peace, yeah? Because of course, all of us would say the peace is a good thing. Yes, uh, of course, but uh, uh, but what it makes good thing is that you you are on the way to the victory, to, to combat the evil. Yes, in that or another way. That's, uh, uh, and that's, I think, something new in our, Western liberal world. We, we have you who put it at the stake and to have it, you have to have different kind of culture. Yeah, you will not do it by festival culture, uh, real, yes. And I'm very much about your concern about kitsch culture uh, and so on that, you know, this overhelming festival, festivalization of our life goes well with imperial culture yes goes well with colonial culture it's not making it a difference it's sure. not making it yes we we will move this discussion to the zoom afterwards when you have a private okay. Okay. because we have a few more minutes only very few more minutes and i would oh, like very much uh, uh mm -hmm. andrew uh, homiak and uh, and will to be able to jump in with the questions mm -hmm. and um, um and so andrew please go ahead We don't hear you, and you have to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. First of all, uh, I, I thank you for for your for your lectures, uh, for your points. Uh, I I have uh, I, I have uh, so, so somewhat uh, provocative and uh, uh, and paradigmatic uh, questions. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, marginalization of Ukrainian cult uh, culture is one of uh, Russian's propaganda narratives today. Uh, they present Ukraine as uh, a state and nation invited by Russia and also uh, downplay the importance of Ukrainian culture in general. Uh, also, uh, the active phase of the way last uh, nine, nine years. So the clash of culture lasted uh, much longer. Uh, do you think mm. the 20th century will see the 
end of uh, this imperialist imperialist culture war and attempts uh, to marginal, marginalize uh, other culture as a hybrid form of war. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Andri, I hope so. That That's the battle we are all involved. Uh, and Ukraine today is a front line for that battle. But I felt I'm struggling for that since many, many years. And suddenly, or suddenly, but, uh, but I found uh, partners, you know, supporters, people I can follow in that understanding. Uh, and it is, you know, why I like I, uh, uh, to quote, for example, Ukrainian intellectuals or poets, writers, because the, their voices are in, um, in a way very mature world, a, a new one, yes? Where, uh, uh, going beyond these comfort zones we created in the West for many years. Uh, so to achieve the goal you are talking about, yeah, we should somehow deconstruct these comfort zones, which will be painful for our European values, you know, our, our uh, hu humanistic attitudes. You know, there was a, a wonderful charter uh, chart in the 20th century of a a pacifist movement, yes. Um, I know I was a pacifist, you know. I, I, it ended up in Sarajevo in the beginning of 90s, yes, but I remember being such a person, yes, for, uh, for many years. And I should somehow go out of my comfort zone when, as you remember at that time, you know, there was embargo for the military help to Bosnia, yes. There was no way to help otherwise and just Send, uh, sending humanitarian aid. And it was our comfort. Yes, we do not uh, have anything to do with military conflicts, uh, war, but we can aid with humanitarian help. Now, the, uh, now the situation is absolutely different, that more and more people understand that we should be engaged in different ways. And I think this is, of course, Ukraine paying a terrible price for that. But we are in in a different situation now. The, I see it as a development towards the di direction we are asking for. Yes, because if we will go this direction, uh, more and more we will be able to deconstruct, colonize, to decolonize uh, uh, also culture. Yes, in, in that way, because we will withdraw our support, our com compromise, conformities with all these weapons, tools, uh, colonial culture is using, yes, uh, also in Western societies uh, as well. That's, that would be my answer in short. Will, Will, uh, you have the screen. Will is sitting right now in Ireland. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, he is from, uh, from uh, Scotland. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently sat in Northern Ireland actually as well, like the North. And um, yeah, thank you, Christoph. Um, I was really interested in that is the idea about universality coming from rootedness. So my research is, mm -hmm. is around the climate crisis and how um, activists are responding to that. Um, I guess the, the climate crisis is, is challenging this ability to be rooted locally, like physically through rising waters and melting ice sheets and, and sort of exposing and threatening mm -hmm. mass migration, creating massive risks to like infrastructure, health, and, and ecologically like eradicating species that uh, you know would have swarmed or, or bloomed around us. So what happens if we view the climate ecological crisis as, as a crisis of culture, which kind of feels those sort of uh, crux of, of part of your talk and, and as climate activists, I suppose, how do I or we face the unrootedness of our future whilst seeking to create like a universality culture, a universal culture of climate action? Um, what is a hopeful vision of a transition toward ecologically oriented universality of, of culture, like a, or mm -hmm. an approach to where we appreciate that um, and, and don't mm -hmm. just burn everything to the ground? Um, right. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm grateful for this breach to environment, to ecology. I'm very often using 
this comparison as well uh, from the cultural part, you know, that I see that we should become more and more ecological in culture, uh, in terms that, for example, the, it's, this is a holistic attitude to your environment, you know, also in culture. What we did in 20th century, we divided, you know, uh, our env culture environment to different entities, ethnic, religious, you know, uh, other identities. So there was no connective tissue, what I, I'm saying, which is really uh, about ecology. Yes, everything is connected somehow, and you should not uh, deal with just one district of your, you know, Christian district in your town to be a citizen of, of that town. You should deal with the whole city you know, uh, taking responsibility as for the whole, and it comes for, from ecology, yes, from, from uh, the way you understand how you can uh, work with an uh, environment. And yes, indeed, I believe, because it's also about responsibility, that this work should be done locally as, uh, uh, as well. It makes people who would uh, support, you know, anti-environmental parties in the center, in the government, can change their mind being responsible you know, on the local ground about uh, what they experience around them, uh, themselves, and how it influences uh, their life. So uh, something that is abstract, more, more abstract, you know, in the center becomes concrete down there and it works. So absolutely, I agree with you with that. Mm. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Liana. Thank you, Katerina. And above all, thank you, Krzysztof. We are going to, this is an official thank you.